Hi everyone, hi dear Posthumans. I am very, very honored and excited to be here with a really inspiring scholar that is, who has come all the way from Denmark to be interviewed at NYU at the blog Posthumans on the topic of posthumanism and literature. Now, uh, my great pleasure uh, is uh, to be here with uh, Ms. Rosendahl Thompson. We already had a previous interview on the topic of evolution, transhumanism, and the Anthropocene. And in this specific uh, interview, we are going to focus on literature and the posthuman because this is one of his great expertise. Mm -hmm. Actually, Mess is professor of comparative literature at Oros University in Denmark. And let me open a little parenthesis here. Uh, Oros University is really a leading university on the topic of the posthuman. Uh, Mess and uh, other scholars have been working on this uh, since actually year 2005. So really we're talking about avant-garde in the humanistic and post-humanistic tradition of academia. Mess has uh, uh, published a lot of books uh, on the topic of uh, post-humanism in relation to literature. We're going to focus on one specific, although I would like also to mention other books that he wrote because I really highly recommend all of them. Now we're going to focus on the book that you actually seen in the screen behind us. The title is The New Human in Literature, Posthuman Visions of Changes in Body, Mind and Society, which was published by Bloomsbury in the year 2013. Uh, he also wrote uh, and co-authored other books on similar topics like the one uh, Literature and the World in 2019 and another one also very important, World Literature and Reader in uh, year 2012. I also want to mention that Mess is actually working on a book that is really highly needed in the field of posthuman studies, which is the Bloomsbury Handbook of Posthumanism, which is coming out in the year 2020. Now, um, Mess again, welcome to our vlog. Thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's our pleasure. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start with a really intriguing topic, mm -hmm. which is uh, literature. Mm -hmm. What does uh, literature bring to the conversation of posthumanism? Mm -hmm. Very important question mm -hmm. and a question that Mess can answer in very interesting ways. Yeah, and it's a big question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, <laughs> it can be answered a lot of ways. I think one of the most interesting things about literature is that it's always concrete. It always imagines entities, people, non-humans uh, in concrete situations. So instead of talking abstractly about things that could change our world, we have to imagine what could a condition be where we are different or where the conditions that we live on are radically different. So that's one thing that literature brings to it. And another thing is that because it tells stories, because it's an aesthetic medium, uh, it has a relationship to, to, uh, to, to making things concrete, but also often in a way that deals with imperfection. I think that's one of the interesting values that literature explores through narrative. Can you imagine narrative without imperfection? Uh, and it goes against the grain of sort of the most optimistic transhumanist thinking of saying, well, we'll have a perfect world at the end. We'll get all things together. And their literature sort of uh, brings something says, well, maybe not. Uh, maybe there's values in the imperfect that we should explore. That and then, and that, that's the important thing about the, uh, this, this very orange cover to my book. The important thing was that there should be a lot of humans uh, mm. and not just this uh, caricature of, of one post-humanist, transhumanist being that is staring at the world in itself. Uh, the point is that literature is a medium that makes us aware of that we are connected with each other, that we use language uh, for ourselves, but with others, that we have been raised with the language and that uh, being a, a person in a society or in a community is part of the human condition. Or if you ask people who really want to write dystopian fiction, they put people in isolation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where everything uh, goes down the drain. That's so interesting. Now, Matt, um, it's really interesting that you're working on this because uh, there are different type of mindsets mm. and for some people reading philosophy boom totally makes mm. sense for other people you know they prefer to watch a movie or uh, maybe they look at, at a picture at a photograph and boom they understand mm. what posthuman yes. may mean yeah. now in literature can you give us some actually practical examples some uh, maybe authors or books mm. that could actually be considered posthuman yeah 
And, and, and you could go two directions. I mean, you have the low-hanging fruits, which are important because they say something about the fascination we have, that mm. uh, you have Mary Shelley and uh, Frankenstein's creation mm. as an avant-garde post-human uh, exploration. You have the work of uh, Philip K. Dick with androids. Uh, so, so you have sort of iconic figures that explores the idea of what it could mean to be uh, post-human. Uh, and also, I mean, as a literary scholar, we often feel that you're sort of one step away from reality, that other disciplines talk more directly about reality. Mm -hmm. You could say that this whole uh, cultural fascination you have in literature, in film and television with uh, post-human figures actually speaks to uh, sort of uh, that this is something happening now mm -hmm. and our medium is sort of actually speaking about a, a particular kind of reality, namely the, the, imagined uh, the imagination of the post-human. What I did in my book, on the other hand, was not to, to pick all the low-hanging fruits, but was to explore how more mainstream authors also have a relation to something you could call post-human, to exploring the paradox on the one hand thinking of uh, humanity as being sort of the end point of history, uh, of the most uh, dignified uh, entity on the world, and certainly the most dominant, uh, if, if nothing else. And then on the other hand, seeing all these uh, rooms for improvement of our morals, of our bodily constitution, of our intellects and so on. Uh, and what I find is that, that you have a lot of desires that sort of uh, burst up uh, throughout literary history. And to give one example, I think that uh, Virginia Woolf is, is a t terrific example of someone who would typically not be considered to be involved with uh, post-humanism. But when you then look at the way that she, there's a desire in the way that she writes to have a different engagement of breaking free from the autonomous subject. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, something that she sort of solves, but she really explores this through her novelistic practice of bringing all in these different voices to experience what does it mean to be connected in a different way to this whole bursting society that we have around us. And, I mean, you also have some beautiful quotes in a room of, her, of one's own where she imagines that the human body will be different in a million years. And you're like, where did that come from? Uh, and you have the Orlando figure uh, that I won't go too much into, but which is also uh, uh, breaking free from the idea that, that gender is binary because Orlando uh, is, is uh, uh, androgynous. Uh, and it also breaks free from the idea that, that you have a generational life uh, because Orlando also lives uh, across centuries. So she conjures up different things with, with both concrete figures. You could say, well, do they fit in? Uh, uh, and where you can say, shouldn't we take it at face value as an interest and not just normalize it and say, well, this is really a symbol for something different. But, but what Rala acknowledges, she was actually very fascinated by these things. Also, by way, of an author who is, I mean, he's not the greatest author, I think, but he was very imaginative. Uh, Olaf Stapledon, uh, who wrote uh, d different novels, The Star Maker and uh, La The Last and the, uh, uh, the First Human, in an exploration of what could we imagine of a radical break from humanity. And Virginia Woolf read those books. I mean, there's records of that, and the commandant was fascinated about it. And there's sort of a sort of a, a, a connection with that sort of uh, early science fiction uh, and to sort of the mainstream highly canonized work uh, of Wolf, and those I would consider sort of the non -low, the not low hanging fruits that you should pick as well. Fantastic, and Mes, since you're also an expert in comparative literature and world literature, mm. I would like to ask you a question of kind of trans space and trans eras, and. Uh, Yes, we can find a lot of examples of posthuman literature in the contemporary field. What about ancient literature? What about something like uh, Metamorphosis yeah. of Ovidius? And what about non-Western literature? Yeah. Can we find a lot of good examples of posthuman literature in, in other fields of outside of contemporary Western uh, literature? Definitely. I mean, uh, and of course, the field changes with if you consider whether technology plays a role or not. Mm. Uh, but you can definitely have an idea of the post-human and post-humanism without technology. And you have lots of people who are going back and, and looking at, so what are the vision of humans uh, in uh, ancient literature uh, or in Renaissance literature? Uh, there's a great uh, edited volume that came out from Fordham uh, a few years ago called Renaissance Post-Humanism. And where they very credibly show that 
all kinds of ideas of humans being connected differently and constituted differently than sort of again from the sort of autonomous uh, subject that, that we have come to think of as being the uh, prototype of the human uh, that those those movements were already in place back then so careful work has been done to to show that there's a long beginning mm. to posthumanism and then of course you have a, a vibrant scene for uh, science fiction uh, in China, in Africa, uh, where people from but the local uh, environment but uh, explore something you could say is of universal consequence because very often literature addresses something that is rooted in a culture and where the comparative perspective, as you say, there's a comparative perspective between uh, different uh, cultures, different literatures, but where the whole idea of something that is transhuman or posthuman uh, sets a difference or sort of unites humanity. Uh, towards something we quite don't know what uh, to do with, and which I actually think, and I've written about that for a uh, for the Cambridge uh, History of World Literature, uh, makes it sort of an interesting universal topic. Something that that connects literature. You sort of uh, you doesn't get cast away by thinking about so what do they mean about being human at that particular place, but what do they mean about being human facing a post-human horizon? Fantastic, Mais, I would like to ask you one more question sure. which is about narratives yes. and narratives do shape the way we think of what does it mean to be human mm. what does it mean to live in a specific era at a specific time and uh, do you see the impact the political social and political impact of stories that are told through books mm. so what uh, how is the agency that literature has in shaping our posthuman future yeah I think it's strong. I mean, you can, you can say that, that uh, a lot of book has been extremely influential. Mm. Uh, Brave New World, uh, mm. 1984, uh, um, which uh, the latter is actually very interesting, also how sophisticated it is mm. in, in terms of technology, uh, also with the human body. Uh, so certainly a lot of warnings from literature. Uh, the tricky part is, of course, uh, how do we have a way of picking the best of what we could imagine we could be mm. uh, if you still believe in some kind of progress. I mean, in cultural progress, but also the kind of progress that technology brings with it. And not just every time ending up in a dystopian vision. And that, that's kind of the, the sometimes there's the problem of fiction. There's this, it's not a really good story to say, well, then we made a lot of uh, smart decisions and uh, things ended up being better. Mm. Even though you could say that the real world for better or worse, and I mean, uh, of course, with the way that we're exploiting uh, resources and so on, could become a very, very bad uh, narrative. But in other terms of uh, producing better, more healthy lives and so on, uh, you could say that there is actually progression uh, in the world. Uh, and that's where literature sometimes has a, uh, has a difficult way of figuring out mm. what kind of narrative do, do we tell. But there is uh, certainly a lot of, of cultural impact. And you can say, again, um, with, with the visions that people, they take in through film, uh, TV, uh, uh, literature, uh, comics, and so on, that this whole fascination of, of what we could become uh, is still uh, very much alive and kicking at the moment. And, and, it and it should be, because it's, those are important topics. And we mm -hmm. need to have multiple ways of addressing them, because uh, even though that you could say that uh, in literature it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an aesthetic playground, uh, they are also closely related to the way that we uh, make ethical and political decisions. I think you really touched upon a point that is very important that needs to be reflected much more on, mm. which is the idea that uh, maybe less so much, maybe less in literature, but a lot definitely in movies, the dystopian future, which yeah, if yeah. you look at, you know, movies or Netflix series or anything related to the future is really 99, mm. I would say dot 5% dystopian. Yeah. And I think this is a this is a political mm. message that we're giving to humanity and we are co-shaping uh, human consciousness with this kind of message. Yeah, so I yeah. think that everything should be balanced and we should be able to see all kind of different futures. Yeah, yeah. So definitely I think, yeah, literature, you're right, there is this dystopian element which is not mm. as as clearly marked yeah. if you compare to you know other yeah. mm, industries like the movie yeah, and yeah. The film production. And I want to ask you one yeah. more question, uh, unless you want just, to say, yeah, yeah, just, yeah of, course, of course, of course. Yeah, basically just, yeah, I, I, you, as you were speaking, I, uh, it came to me that how Donna Haraway mm. made a plea for saying, it's very important to have joy in life, mm. to have something that engages you. And if you don't embrace joy as well, you can't imagine a better future. Mm. So it's so that aspect. And of course, even though we write some works off as being dystopian, 
they're complex, of course, and there's a lot of humor, a lot of satire and so on, a lot of different ways, things to take away. But the end point very often is that uh, we shouldn't go that way. So where should we go then? Yeah. For sure. So, so yeah. yeah, and to go back to Haraway, I like also the idea of uh, bringing joy and also bringing the fact of staying with the trouble, like seeing where we're mm. at doesn't mean that we're yeah. going to push, you know, a dystopian future, but seeing where we're at, being, yeah. you know, like being aware of the human condition, post-human condition at the moment, 21st century Anthropocene, and still be able to uh, open, open eyes and see maybe joyful, yes. uh, the, the, the present and the future, just joyfully. Okay, I have last question. Because um, is literature a fruit of human creativity? And if so, can only human be creating literature? Or we can see right now, which is already have poetry written by mm. machines, can we see novels that are going to impact human consciousness that are not written by humans? Yeah, that's an interesting paradox because, on the one hand, Literature is actually one of the most exclusive uh, human phenomena, mm. also in the arts. I mean, you, you could have uh, birds that are singing, obviously, uh, mm. uh, animals that are acting uh, in, in human uh, uh, relationships and so on. Whereas literature and the enjoyment and creation of literature is, is very, very much human. And, and even if you have machines that write something, which is a huge topic, uh, you could say that's also an extension of, of, mm. of the humans. On the other hand, uh, literature is very good at including a non-human perspective on things, of, of mm. giving voice, of uh, having visions uh, that include at least the attempt to include uh, the, uh, other, other perspectives on the world. Uh, so I think that's an interesting paradox in the way that literature as a medium, as an art form, uh, is, is constituted. So, of course, there is much more to talk about. Yes. This is why I would like to remind uh, all our, uh, um, to our audience that uh, Metz, I have a lot of books on this uh, uh, topic. Specifically, here we're talking about the new human in literature, uh, posthuman visions of changes in body, mind, and society that really addresses uh, uh, this topic uh, um, from uh, uh, imagination, aesthetics, and ethics together to really reflect on the conflict uh, desires between the individual and the society and the planet as a whole. So you can see that again, Mas uh, has already contributed a lot to the posthuman field, and I would really advise you to check his work online and also to have the chance to maybe study with him. His teachings at, at, at Oros University in this really great uh, environment where there are a lot of people interested mm. in, this, in this topic, so you're going to be in good company. So, uh, Mas, thank you so much for coming here, yeah. you know, to NYU to talk with us um, about our posthuman condition. It's been a great pleasure. And again, uh, not only literature, Mas also has uh, inspired us to really think about evolution, transhumanism, the Anthropocene with mm -hmm. our uh, first uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been really wonderful having you here. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you for your questions. Thank you so much. And the last question, what if people want to connect with you? Is the Oros page the way to go or is some other way of social media? Yeah, I mean, you can Google me and write me an email. Okay. That's very easy. Uh, but uh, the humanfutures.au.dk is the website you should go to. Of which Mess is also the director. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Mess. You're, you're most welcome.